Hey everyone, um, my name is Nodell. I'm on staff here at the Hope Collective and today I'll be reading through James chapter one, verses two through four. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. This is the word of the Lord. Um, how many of you read James at least three times this week? That was the homework that we were given by Alex. Well done. Well done. That is awesome. How many have found it rich to read through something over and over and new things pop out and things you're like, oh, that's where that is. I've heard that verse, but I didn't know that's where that was. How many memorized the verse that was just read? You got those three memorized. Well done. That's awesome. Let's continue on that journey. We are in this series in James. We're going through the book of James. We've entitled it Wrecked, How to Avoid a Life of Ruin. And we believe James has kind of laid this out for us. And Alex did a phenomenal job introducing us. And at the end, he said, if, if James was to give us a diagnosis, if we were sitting in front of him, and I asked him to send this to me because I need you to hear this again. When he was reading this, I was like, oh, Gosh, I mean, it's so powerful what James is challenging us. So if he was to diagnose us today, this is what he said. Would you let me just read this back to you, what Alex shared with us? Can I do that? From James, when you finally cross the finish line of this life, no one's handing out medals for things that don't ultimately matter. There's no prize for most times reading through the Bible, most minutes spent in prayer, most scripture memorized, most meals fasted, most worship services attended. And if me saying all that makes you think that all those things are unimportant, then we're that much farther behind. The point of all those things is to help you know the love of Jesus and show that love to others. If your faith stops between your ears and doesn't actually show up in the way you treat people, was it ever really there to begin with? I know that there are a lot more influences in your life that are a lot more subtle in how they want to shape your life. The world, the flesh, the devil are very real and very sly. So me being this forthright could be challenging to hear and maybe even off-putting, off but please hear me. Life is too short, and this is too important for me to be unclear and for you to be petty. I don't, want, I don't want you to wreck your life, and I've seen the things that seem to make the difference between followers of Jesus who make it and those who don't. And if you want to be upset with someone who loves you enough to tell you the truth, I've been doing this too long to be offended by that. And at the end of the day, it's your choice anyway. Just do me a favor. If you're going to be upset with someone who's trying to save your life, then at least be as upset with the people who are trying to steal your life without you even realizing it. The voices and influences in that are telling you that you're just fine, that it doesn't matter what you do, that Jesus loves you no matter what and doesn't want you to change a bit, that he meant something entirely different when he said, whoever listens to my teaching and follows it. But just as up, be, be just as upset with those voices that are putting a smoke screen around your mind while they hollow out your soul, getting you ready for the wreck that's coming. I'm going to do my job. You need to do yours. So if you're up for this, if you're ready for some real talk, want to avoid a life of ruin, then let's do this. Yeah. So that's the catch up. That's the reminder. And so this morning, we're going to James chapter 2, 3, and 4. James 1, chapter 2, 3, and 4. And we're going to talk about suffering well. What does it look like to suffer well? James chapter 1, verse 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, reading from the ESV, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Suffering well, why? Why is it important that we suffer well? Let me take a few minutes and maybe explain that. I say this often. I got it from a guy by the name of Leonard Sweet. Sociologist, theologist, 
amazing guy who would always say, you're always in one of three places in your life. And I'm going to add to that for one of three reasons. But you're always in one of three places. You are either going into a storm, in the middle of a storm, or coming out of a storm. But in humanity, you will always face storms. I don't care what the American dream tells you. It promises a hope it cannot fulfill. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness doesn't keep you from suffering. Because this is life. And we suffer for three reasons. And I want you to get this because this is important. What we bring on ourselves, we suffer troubles, trials, difficulties, trauma, all those things come from three places. And God allows it all, by the way. He allows it all. What we bring on ourselves through our own brokenness. Whatever decisions we make, the things we do to others, the things we do to ourselves, we bring suffering on ourselves because of our own brokenness. Second, what others do to us as a result of their brokenness. We experience pain and struggles and trauma and difficulty in life because of what others do, because of their brokenness that I have no control over, but it comes anyway. And lastly, what the world brings as a result of its brokenness. It's not how God designed it. We're not living in the design of God, but God is making it right. He's reconciling. He's making all things new, including us, including those around us, including the world he created. He is making it new, but it is broken, and therefore we will suffer that brokenness. Now, let me, let me jump up on a soapbox real quick. I am so tired in this culture of victim mentalities. I am done with everybody being the victim. Because when everybody's the victim, nobody's the victim. When everybody is the victim, it has numbed our hearts to those who actually are. And it is rampant. And I want to tell you something. There are two places, two reasons why we suffer. The brokenness of others and the brokenness of this world. But there is also the brokenness of ourselves. That is why we suffer. And so I want to challenge this victim mentality that I keep hearing about and seeing with this right here. Don't play the victim to circumstances you created. Don't play the victim to circumstances you created. Why? Because you won't change. You won't have the opportunity to become what Jesus has you to become. And if you need help determining whether or not it's something you brought on yourself or something is done to you so that you can actually be a victim if you are so God can bring healing to your heart and we can move on. We were never designed to be victims forever. God has a healing plan. It's for freedom that Christ set us free. But if you need help, then talk to people around you and they'll help you. So those three things, we're always going into a trial in the middle or coming out. And it's either our brokenness, someone else's brokenness, or the brokenness of this world that brings the suffering. So this is why we need to learn to suffer well, because suffering happens. It's part of life. It's part of the landscape of our brokenness. And so true joy in the midst of trial is one of the most powerful witnesses a Christian can model to an unbelieving world. And I want you to get this. True joy in the midst of trial. It's what James is talking about. Is one of the most powerful witness tools that we can be to an unbelieving world. Now let me unpack this. In and of themselves, our struggles, our trials, our traumas are, diff- are not joyful. Okay? So when he, says, when he says, consider it joy, pure joy, right? He's not saying that you have to go, trial, yes! <laughs> so excited. Can't wait. It's not what he's saying. In and of themselves, our struggles, our trials are not joyful. It's what makes them hard. So what does it really mean to count it all joy? And when James tells us to count it all joy, he does not mean it all, our pain, all our trials, all our hardships is joy in and of themselves. It's not what he's saying. So we don't have to be masochistic. They're going to come. You don't have to encourage it. When James tells us that, what is he saying? Listen, pain is pain. Pain is pain. It's not joy. Trials are trying. They're not sources of pleasure. So are we clear? 
What James is telling us and what the gospel of Jesus gives us is a lens on life by these three verses. It is a lens on life. It is spiritual eyes, if you will. And good Lord, if there's one prayer you prayed every morning, ask God for spiritual eyes. Aren't you tired of seeing the world through human eyes? It was in 2 Kings chapter 6 where Elisha and his servant were surrounded by the armies, the enemies against them, right? And the servant was going crazy saying, we're dead, we're done, it's over. And Elisha goes, hey, God, would you just please open his eyes? Those that are with us are way more than those that are with them. And God opened the eyes of the servant and the servant saw around the enemies of Elisha all of the chariots of fire of heaven. See, we got to learn to see with spiritual eyes. And what James is doing is he's given us a lens to see suffering so that we can suffer well. It's spiritual. This lens is a spiritual perspective. It's a kingdom perspective on reality. And through this lens, we see, especially as followers of Jesus, that life's most painful trials have a vital part to play in our joy. Vital part to play in our joy. In God's kingdom, life's most painful trials serve a special purpose for our good. Can you believe that? They serve a purpose for our good. Christians, if we get anything in this world, get this suffering piece. This will be a beacon to the world if we get this suffering piece. Not just, it's, it's not just our good in the long run. It's actually our good even in the midst of the trial. We're thinking, man, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to, God's got something better for me on the other side, but I'm just going to suffer through. No, no, he's got something good for you in the midst of it too. So when trials assault our shallow pleasures, and we've built a lot of them, when, when trials and suffering and difficulty assault our shallow pleasures, we're challenged to consider our deepest treasure. And to evaluate those places in ways we simply don't when all is well. When he begins to take away the things through the suffering or allow them to go, we get to see what our heart is truly built on. We get to see what sits on the throne of who we are. We get to see what we really worship. Where our values actually lie. What our values actually are. Is faith your foundation or is finances? James does not say, count it only joy. God does not expect us to receive our trials as only joy. And I think more than anyone else, a follower of Jesus should be most ready to receive pain as pain, tragedy as tragedy, and trauma as trauma. Because we also get to show that God's bigger and God's greater. We count or conclude our trials as joy because we know it's deeper than what's simply happening to us. God has promised to use them for our good, so it's actually what's happening in us. Listen, th this is what's crazy. For the world, it's what's happening to them. Suffering, difficulty, storms. But for the follower of Jesus, it's what we know God is going to do in us. Through every one of them. Transforming us into the image of Jesus into people who can make a difference in a world that desperately needs Jesus. I'm just getting started here. It's not just big trials and it's not just small trials. I'm giving you some perspective on suffering right now. I'm going to tell us how we suffer well. He says trials of various kinds because he means all of them. You're like, well, my trials are small. No, 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 no. Still trials. Still an opportunity. Well, mine are big. You just don't understand. No, he does. He's talking about various trials. It can be easy to see how God is at work in life's little inconveniences, but our greatest tragedies bring up the hardest, darkest questions in our soul. And if the questions are there, then they're there because it's in us. You say, what do you mean? What kind of questions? Has God abandoned me? Have you ever asked that? Is he really in control? Does he understand what's happening? Is he really good? Is he even there? Does he see me right now? Why won't he answer? You been there? And James is charging us to count it all joy in all of it. Especially the big stuff that life throws at us. The trials, the tragedy, the loss, the distress, the discouragement, the hopelessness. And guess what? That's the end goal of the enemy, isn't it? Hopelessness. 
despair. It's the point of the suffering. The enemy is trying to bring you down and God is going to use it to bring you up. That's why it's so good to be a follower of Jesus because you know it. That's why in Romans, Paul says in chapter five, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. So Paul's saying it, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces what? Hope, Hope, not despair, not hopelessness. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Hope, he's saying, doesn't disappoint us because of God's love for us. We're fully vindicated as a child of God. Therefore, God has us and everything that comes against us, he will use to raise us into the image of his son. Everything. It's a perspective change, church. Why count it all joy? Well, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. And we can stamp over every trial in our life. This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. We can say with Paul, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed, Romans 8, 18. Or say with Jesus, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven, Matthew 5, 12. But verse three tells us that James has something more than even all that, which is really good stuff. Something bigger in mind and it's steadfastness. Another word for it would be endurance. And so I looked up endurance. You ever do that? And it says suffer. I'm like, well, that's not helpful. (laughs) Suffer so you can suffer. Okay, so I went down to the second one, and here's what it said. Remain in existence, last, endure. Yeah, it's hard, but if you'll stay there and it'll last, something is going to happen because God promised something is going to happen. Endurance in what? What are we enduring? And James is clear, it is endure in faith, and faith in Jesus. Enduring in faith. James is saying, this is what life is all about. You needed a goal? Here it is. You're like, well, I got a goal. Get rid of it. Here's the goal. (laughs) Do you want a goal? If you need a perspective, here it is. Endure in faith. Well, but it's okay if you have some doubts. Don't stay there. (laughs) That's later in James, right? talk about don't doubt, but we're like, oh, you got it. No, 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 no. You either know he is who he says he is, or you don't know. That's it. And so to live in doubt is to be double-minded, to say one thing and act in another. Endure in faith that everything he says is true. And if we do not endure in faith, we will be on the wrong side of what matters most in this world, which is being right with God and enjoying him forever in Jesus. Everything that is most important in this world, being right with God, that Jesus accomplished for you, and then enjoying Jesus forever. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share this, and this is gonna be hard to grasp, and I've been trying to think of a illustration and water or bowling balls or Oreos. I just couldn't figure it out. Okay. So you're just going to have to close your eyes and figure it out. (laughs) Suffering is practicing for heaven. Suffering is practicing for heaven because here's what happens. We want the Jesus that makes everything good and protects us from everything that's hard. And if we have that Jesus, then we trust him. But if things get really difficult, then we don't. And we doubt and we question and we wonder. And what he is doing in that is he is exposing the very fact that you like him when things are good, but you question him when they're not. And what he's looking for is somebody that doesn't enjoy him because of what they get from him, but simply enjoys him because he's him. 
And there is not, listen to me, if you don't enjoy Jesus right now, there is no switch in heaven that you walk over the threshold of those pearly gates and it goes on and you go, Jesus! (laughs) It's not going to happen. And so what suffering is doing is saying, will you love Jesus in the good and the bad? And does it not even matter whether it's good or it's bad? I got Jesus, so I've got joy. That's what, that's what suffering is practicing for. I'll take it. Bring it. Whatever you got. Because I've got Jesus. And I will take Jesus. Give me Jesus. There's so many songs around it. Is it true about us? How does that become our reality here, this enjoying Jesus Well, we let God test our faith and we count it all joy. And one of the things that God is doing when he tests our faith is he is preserving our faith. Not maintaining. Don't don't misinterpret this. Protecting maybe somewhat better, but not even. Preserving our faith. When he lovingly brings trials or allows trials into our lives, he is working for us. You got to see this, not against you. He is working for you and in us. One of the greatest goods that you could ever imagine, which is hope which is the goodness of God. And when he tests us, he is taking action to keep us. Do you get me? A lot of people have walked away from Jesus because they didn't allow the testing of their faith so that God could keep them. He is working to keep us, to save us. It's called salvation. It's called sanctification. We've said salvation is the process of becoming human. Suffering will draw us to that place if we allow it. And God keeps us not just by maintaining our present level of faith and not just by growing and improving and developing and maturing our faith, but in testing our faith, he is keeping it alive so he can grow it. You've walked through suffering and seen God in it and on the other side been more than a conqueror and it brings you to life knowing that no matter what God does or doesn't do, I'm going to be growing in my faith. Why? Because it's alive in me right now. Because in every battle and every trial and every difficulty, I see him. And he walks with me and he never leaves me nor forsakes me. And on the other side, I'm more like Jesus. James 1, 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. The thing that God is doing in us through our pain and difficulty, every trial, big and small, is essential to what matters most, growing our faith. Faith does not flourish when it lies untested. Why why is your heart dead in faith right now? Because you're not, you're running from every suffering. You're asking God to rescue you from it before it even starts. And what is that doing? Just like any muscle, it atrophies when it goes unexercised and it eventually dies. So when God loves us with his saving love and gives us saving faith, he commits because he cares for us to infuse our lives with various trials to train and grow and strengthen and mature what matters most in us. Not our 401k, but his faith. Our various trials in this life are not meaningless to our enduring in faith. And they are not just threats to losing our faith. They are one of God's essential means through which he preserves the faith he's given us and keeps us as his kids in him. That's what suffering is doing. Keeping us in him. Count it all joy because he's choosing to save you, to keep you as his own. Suffering is the health club for our spiritual life. And boy, do we hate health clubs. (laughs) How do I suffer well then? Well, I'm going to give this to you really quick. Because I think Peter gives us the way to do that. 
And whether you're listening to Paul, you're listening to James, or you're listening to Peter, they're all telling us the same thing. And like any response, the work is in the preparation. No one can automatically have the ability to be sorrowful and yet at the same time always be joyful without first being in God's presence, seeking God, being in proximity to him. It is, it is out of the abiding life of Jesus that we actually can have joy and sorrow. Period. I tell my kids all the time, do not wait till you're in the situation to make a right choice. Have the right choice determined before you get there. No different with suffering. If we want to suffer well, we need to learn where to stand, where to look when our storms come, and not when they come, but before they come. And when suffering comes, and it will, we don't need answers, we need promises. I need you to get this, because we're always looking for answers. Nope, you just need promises. So let me give you three. I'm going to give them to you right now. If we get to all of them, great. If we don't, you'll have them. Let me give them to you sticky. You ready for that? And then I'll give the longer version. Eyes up. God is good. Stick together. Eyes up. God is good. Stick together. There is an assault on all three. Because the enemy of your soul wants suffering to take you out, not lift you up. So what do I mean? Eyes up. Keep your eyes up. Before we can truly experience the good that God has for us in suffering, we have to see our suffering on earth in light of what is waiting for us in heaven. And we are so bad at this. Not all of us, but if, it's, if you're bad at this, just own it. Right? So bad. First Peter 1, 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. Now Peter's about to dig into the suffering of the early church under persecution. And here's what he's starting with. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Keep your eyes up. Keep your focus. You are an alien in this world just passing through. Don't get caught up being comfortable here. Long for heaven. Think about heaven. Study heaven. The day when it's all put right, when we get to be with Jesus face to face and everything's made clear. Before Peter sympathizes with their suffering, he points them heavenward. And suffering has a way of making the difficult circumstances of the present seem ultimate. As if our whole existence is summed up in this awful moment, this awful suffering. But for those with a living hope, suffering is never ultimate. And I need you to hear this. One author says it this way. Anticipating heaven doesn't eliminate pain, but it lessens it and puts it in perspective. Meditating on heaven is a great pain reliever. It reminds us that suffering and death are temporary conditions. Our existence will not end in suffering and death. They are but a gateway to our eternal life of unending joy. (laughs) Alex, I'm going to challenge you on something. He's like, great, this is regular. (laughs) We need more songs about heaven. Man, church, I grew up, Goose, right? We sing them together, you and I. And I've sung them before. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king, right? And tears, listen, I'm growing up in church and tears streaming down the saints, their eyes, weeping, Hoping, longing. I can't stand being here. I want to be there. I have a home prepared where the saints abide. Over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side. Over in the glory land. You know what I'm saying? Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. Come on. To a home where joy shall never end. I'll fly away. Hey! I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. Yeah! When I die, hallelujah, by him. Come on. (laughs) 
we forgot how to fly. Church, we've forgotten how to fly. Forgotten how to long for. It'll change your suffering. It'll change it forever. I, I'm, I'm repenting before the Lord today that I've bought into lie that this place is better. It's just not. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. Right? <laughs> Listen. <laughs> This is what it was like. This is what it was like. You didn't have to wait for the worship pastor to lead the song. It just came. Man, there were songs that would, would come up. With, uh, charismatics. All right. There we go. We got to be done. Remember, God is good. Keep your eyes up. Remember, God is good. Peter said in, in chapter 1, 6 or 7, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I do it all for him because I want to be like him. And so I endure it because he's with me in it. Lastly, always stick together. Keep your eyes up. Remember God is good. God is good. You know what? Don't let the devil assault that. God is good. God is good. Always stick together. Suffering can separate us from thoughts of heaven, making today feel ultimate, and suffering can isolate us from one another, leaving us feeling more and more alone. Instead of withdrawing from one another, Peter encourages precisely what suffering people might be prone to neglect. 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Earnestly. Stand with me. Um, I, <laughs> prophetically, if I can, the suffering doesn't get less as we move forward. Never dreamed I would live in a day where the church could fall under persecution, where my kids could grow up in a lack of freedom to express what we believe. And if you don't think we're there, then you're not paying attention. And so God has given us this great gift to suffer well. James proclaims it. And it could be the greatest message, testimony to an unbelieving world that we walk through suffering, counting it all joy. Because we know that we know that we know that God is keeping us alive in every suffering saving us as he grows us in our faith. But here's what I want to do. Some of you may be headed into a storm you don't know it. Man, may God prepare your heart as a result of this message today and may you keep your eyes up. May you believe all the way through that God is good and may you stick together. May you pour people around you. I remember, uh, many of you don't, don't know this, I walked through um, early in my, in my ministry years of divorce. My first wife walked away from me for another person. Devastated when I got the divorce papers. And I remember calling my buddies and saying, hey, I'm coming home from work. I'm weeping. I said, meet me at the house and bring your guitars. I just need to worship. 
just need to worship. Do you know they all showed up, left work, dropped it all, was right there. Couldn't have made it through without it. And it reminded me of Jesus as we just sang all the songs that kept the focus on him. You may be coming out of a storm and you can testify that, to this more than anybody else in the room that he is good. And I can't wait to get to heaven because that stunk. But if you're in the midst of a suffering moment, I want to pray for you today because you need perspective. So if that's you, I'm going to invite you just to come forward right now. You're saying, man, it's, it's, it's little, it's big, whatever it may be, but I'm in the middle of a trial, a difficulty, a hard time. I want you to come and stand. Come all the way to the front. Listen, this is an opportunity. God is leading this to be prayed over. Don't miss it because our pride keeps us in our seat. Let's say, no, I'm, this is family. We do this together. And if, and if this is all the people suffering in the room, I, I, think, I think we're missing an opportunity. But I want you to come. And I, I'm, I'm not promising God's going to pull you out of it. He rarely does, but he'll walk with you through it. And I'm going to pray today that you're reminded of his goodness. Come all the way around. Let's just fill this, fill this place up. Everybody who's coming, you're walking through it. We're just going to, we're going to take a little bit of extra time. And we're going to pray. And, and we can pray that God heals and restores and brings us out. But more than that, that God's will be done in the midst. Can we pray that and believe that? And those of you that are out there and you've just come out of a trial and you are celebrating the goodness of God in the land of the living, would you just come right now and put a hand on somebody that's here and say, man, I, I can testify that God is good and that he will walk with you through this and you will, be, you will be more than a conqueror and you will come out enduring in hope. And let's just make sure everybody just has somebody with them. Let's put a hand forward to the rest of us and say, okay. God, we pray right now in this space for our family. We pray right now for those who have in humility stepped from the comfort into the unknown to say, God, you see me. I know you see me. And I know you know it better than I do what I'm walking through. And I am reaching out in this moment to say, help. Open their spiritual eyes in Jesus' name. Give them strength in their weakness through the power of your Holy Spirit and through those you've surrounded them with to overcome, to be more than a conqueror. And God, may your will be done in the midst of this storm, in the midst of this trial. In God, we are not responsible for what others have done to us. We are responsible for how we carry it. And so we lay it at your feet. And we ask you, God, to bring healing, to bring hope, to bring wholeness, to bring your presence, to bring strength, to bring peace. And that, God, you would have your way. It was the most humble thing Jesus prayed. Not my will, but what your will be done. We don't see the end. We don't need to. God, we trust you. The devil's a liar. And so we ask that truth come in waves to every mind and every heart. And that, God, you would be their God. And that they would be your child. And they would allow you the space to hold them in this season. So we give you praise. We give you honor because you're worthy. Can we sing this over them? You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. Here it is. Good and bad. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Come on, church, with everything we got. You are worthy of it all, everything. You are worthy of it all. 
for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory for from you for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory so god of all the suffering may that be true on the other side that you have got the glory that it is yours and yours alone and the believer is standing there growing in faith alive because they saw you in the midst of the fire and so we will give you praise and glory we will keep our eyes up we will believe that you are good and we will stick together in jesus name amen amen Amen. Amen.